one word, vaccines. Today we're talking vaccines with virologist Dr. Sherry Lee. And we're talking between facts and what we've heard on the street, what we've heard from my cousin, what we've heard from Lil Ray Ray, so we can get down to the bottom. So welcome to starting with today's The Shape Up. Stay tuned and we'll get started soon. And Dr. Lee is in the building. So let's try this. One more again. <laughs> Hi. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. How does it sound now? Let me see. It's. I think it sounds better. That's the one, two, one. Oh, check, one no, two. I'm still not getting any sound out of my. I'm still not getting any sound out of my um, phone. I can hear you a little bit, but not really well. That's crazy. Uh, you tried the air. The earbuds are not working either. Okay. All right, I'm back. <laughs> does it? How does how does it sound now? I mean, I can. It's it's really low, but I can still hear you. So I might have to ask you to repeat something, or maybe get a little closer to the mic. But I think that'll be fine. Okay, I'm gonna go up a little bit closer. Okay. <laughs> and um, we'll we'll try to get through it, and let me know um, if I need to repeat anything. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. No? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So starting with today, um, it's a nonprofit. We're based in the Washington, D.C. area. We provide mental health, uh, career development services, and also uh, economic empowerment tools to our community. And one of the things we do uh, as part of our wellness programs is make sure we're bringing in Black professionals to talk about um, issues that are directly affecting our community, um, that are a part of our community, and that uh, support our community. So it's a very um, communal uh, exchange of information. Um, but the key thing is to make sure we're getting the right information, the most accurate information. So that is why today we're excited to bring back Dr. Cherry Lee. Uh, we brought her in last year with Dr. Tiffany Turner. We had a two-part series when we started of uh, the beginning of COVID. And um, we talked about health in our communities. And Dr. Lee talked about uh, viruses and how they behave in our bodies. So there was an extensive um, overview. But one of the things that stand out the most is that you said we were going to be in this pandemic for a while. <laughs> and I was like, they said two weeks, a month, you know, two months maybe. And you just like, no. <laughs> no sis sorry <laughs> <laughs> and so it just goes back to being believe black women because <laughs> you could have gaslit us you know what I'm saying you could have made us hopeful but you were like we're already mm -hmm. behind the virus we're already very behind this virus um, yeah. so let me give an introduction and I want you to add on as well we have Dr. Sherry Lee she is a virologist who has studied viruses in the body for over 20 years. She has also um, co-authored several research studies about viruses and how they behave in our body. She earned her, her PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from Penn State University. Credentials, y'all, credentials. So when you hear <laughs> information on the street, you know, just get some credentials, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so anything else I should add to this amazing bio with your brilliant mind? Anything else I should add? Um, I think that's it. You know, I've, I've worked with a d number of different viruses, but most importantly, they've all been RNA viruses. Um, and that's important because coronavirus is an RNA virus and a lot of human pathogens are RNA viruses. So understanding how they function and how they work is really key for us to be able to prevent disease and create vaccines and any other kind of prophylactic. So yeah, RNA awesome. viruses are very quick, important. <laughs> quick overview about your day now. I believe you're still at NIH. Um, and you work on um, viruses there as well, correct? Yeah, so at, um, currently I do work on HIV. 
Um, I actually work with the virus SIV, which is simian immunodeficiency virus. So it's how HIV evolved from. Mm. And we use rhesus macaques as a model for AIDS pathogenesis in humans. So um, rhesus macaques are one of the most incredible animal models. Um, that we have for studying viruses because they're such a great match for humans. Mm. And so there's a lot that we can learn, um, especially from about HIV, but studying these animals. So it's quite a sacrifice that they make, but we've gained so much insight into them. And they're also being used as a model to study the coronavirus as well and the vaccines too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us again. Um, and it's been a year, you know, uh, we're, we're coming up on the year on this virus. I remember uh, we had met um, before, you know, we, we, I was talking to Dr. Um, Gaskin. I was like, what's his, what's his last name? <laughs> Dr. Byron Gaskin. <laughs> um, and about in January of 2020 about, you know, what this virus was looking like. And then we end yeah. up catching up early March and like, he's like, it's time to start stocking up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> about to shut down. <laughs> yes, it's going down. Um, and so and now we're in a new year, 2021. We also have a new president, right? And so I want you to give a little bit of feedback. Uh, we just heard that Texas and Mississippi, um, Texas is my home state, born, raised, bred in Texas. Um, my best friend is from Mississippi, uh, from Nashville, mm. Mississippi. Um, and those elected officials have opened up the state completely at 100%, no, no mask uh, requirements anymore. So what's the role of, you feel, of a president and of elected officials as far as our, 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 our health? Well, I think what we've learned, um, especially in this past year with the previous administration, that a lot of... Um, mandates come down. So individual states can behave how they want and create laws. We all have different laws in individual states, but at the federal level, the, you know, the federal government can state what everybody does and they can put laws into place that force everybody to behave in a very similar fashion. And I think what we have seen is that there has been a lack of of that in the previous administration, especially when it came down to this virus. And I mean, it, granted in the beginning, you know, there wasn't a lot known. I mean, we this, this, the virus came out in December, 2019. I mean, and we learned about it very quickly, but we didn't learn a lot about it, you know, immediately day one. True. So, you know, as the year has progressed, we were learning more and more information, but what we knew from the beginning was that it was deadly. And so a lack of action, you know, maybe a lack of action at the beginning, you can make an excuse for that. But towards the end, when we're, you know, deep into developing vaccines and people are dying and we've hit, you know, new thresholds every day, I mean, you can see that, no action from a federal government is, you know, pretty damaging and deadly to all of us. Right. And, and not, not even pretty, like massively, right? So we're at 500,000 plus Americans have yeah. died um, because of this, this disease and mostly because of lack of federal uh, management and, and public health um, priorities uh, for on both the federal and the state level. Um, that yeah. we've seen. Uh, so that's really good. I think one of the things, too, we'll see how the Biden administration begins to, you know, what what they're going to do on a federal level with states like Texas and Mississippi pushing back against, um, you know, what we, the CDC is saying best, best practices. Um, and so it'll be, there's still work to do, I believe, as you know, yeah. a lot of people have taken a back seat, like, oh, everything's okay. But I think there's still work to do as far as making sure our elected officials are mandating um, or prioritizing the people in our community. Yeah. Speaking of people in our community, um, what we knew very early on is that Black people were getting hit harder with this with this virus. Um, we were dying at, at higher risk. We were getting um, more severe cases of it. Um, and so can we talk about now where we are between COVID and the vaccine, what's the risk 
for black people? What what should we be looking out for? What have we we know we know anecdotally, I know what we've seen and heard and experienced a loss. I, I don't know anyone who has not been affected a year in um by, you know, this loss, whether you know, directly or one person removed, you know. Um so what can you talk about black people in the risk? Um where we are for, for still for the risk for COVID and then what risks are associated with, you know, possibly the vaccines? So I know that's kind of a heavy question. So I think, for, remember what we talked about, you know, last year, it's crazy that it's been a year, um, is that the risk to Black people was due to the fact that more Black people and um, people of color tend to be essential workers um, that had to work outside of the home. They didn't have the ability to stay inside, stay indoors. Um, and this caused uh, a lot of them to be more exposed to the virus. And then you also have other issues like socioeconomic issues where their health is more poor. And so the virus itself, you know, there's a, you get infected with COVID and there's like a viral phase, but then there's also an inflammatory phase. Mm. So the more pre-existing conditions you have, the worse that inflammatory phase is going to be for you. And the more, more likely you are to succumb to disease. And so we do know that due to a lot of socioeconomic reasons that Black people are more at risk due to working outside the home during having poor, mm -hmm. poor health, not having access to health care, not having access to proper nutrition. Um, and so as we now move out of this phase of, okay, let's say we've learned how to protect against COVID, we learned how to be in public or do our jobs with masks on and washing our hands, and now we have these vaccines on the way, what is now the issue? Well, the issue now is, is that disproportionately now more um, non-Black people or more white people are getting the vaccine compared to those of that you know, compared to that of Black people. Um, for what reason that is, maybe, you know, I think we've all seen kind of like some news reports where some people are cutting the line or skipping the line. Um, but we also seen a lot of news reports where there's a lot of di mistrust in the government when it comes to the Black community yeah. and feeling like this vaccine is another way to test on us um, mm -hmm. and to harm us. And we and it because also it came out so fast um, that there is concern that it wasn't properly vetted correctly. And, you know, there are all these buzzwords about new technology with a couple of the vaccines and people don't know what are questioning what's being injected into them. So there seems to be a lot of fear about getting the vaccine and therefore shying away from it and saying, no, I'm not gonna get it. And I, that could also add to um, the disproportionate number of black and brown people that are receiving the vaccine at this time. Right, and so we've seen that definitely in Maryland as well, where even in Baltimore County, um, a lot of uh, people who are receiving the vaccine, I believe they said 20 out of the 25,000 uh, vaccine, 20,000 out of 25,000 vaccines, like we're going outside of the county to Montgomery County to Anne Arundel. Um, so it was crazy numbers where people who needed the most weren't getting. But the trust factor is really important and it's valid, right? So I think one of the things that um, I haven't really heard from the scientific community on a national scale is that Black people should be weary. You know what I'm saying? We should, there is some hesitation that is rooted in, in history um, and science that, that validates that, you know, historically Black uh, people have been experimented on in this country. What's interesting, though, is that <laughs> we see this dynamic where white people are coming into Black communities to get the vaccine early, right? So uh, the vaccines, you know, there's, they are, they, if, if there was an experiment <laughs> going on in our hoods, um, white people are, are getting that experiment as well, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a, a piece. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this new technology, right? I know when you talked last year, one of the things you have brought up was that, you know, it takes years to create a vaccine. I mean, you need a lot of testing. 
you need a lot of you go through a lot of phases or a lot of checkpoints in between um you have to see what some of the short-term effects are and what some of the long-term effects are can you give us an overview of what happened with this uh, particular vaccine and how they were able to expedite it because you did note that last year as well that they will be able to expedite that with proper resources and dedication if it's all hands on deck. Um, and so how has this process been with some of the early vaccines that are out now? Um, so with this particular vaccine, so the virus was discovered in December 2019. And by the end of January, the entire virus was sequenced. Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, we've had years and years of technology building up. So where like sequencing of genes in the laboratory at this point, you can just do in your sleep for most people. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's just kind of like a most generic <laughs> technology we have. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, <laughs> it it's so easy, Charlene. <laughs> Everyone can do it and you're in your garage, you know, <laughs> just set it up. <laughs> sequence some viruses. Right. So, <laughs> so we had the virus sequence. Um, we knew the sequence of the virus by the end of, dis of January, and that um, sequence was published widely available to everyone. So what's exciting about this uh, new vaccine technology, so I'll go with the Pfizer and Moderna, um, because it's the mRNA technology. So I know that for Moderna, so mRNA vaccine technology has been actually worked on probably for the past five, six years okay. um, at this point. So even at Moderna was come out of NIH. So researchers have been working on this mRNA vaccine technology for quite a long time. And there was also um, a lab that had been working on the va uh, vaccine for MERS. So okay. MERS was a Middle Eastern respiratory virus is another coronavirus that came out in the early 2000s or like 2013. So they had been developing a vaccine for MERS using this mRNA technology. And so they actually were right at the point where they were going to go into a phase one clinical trial. Okay. But the thing is with vaccines, as we probably have learned over this past year, it's a lot of money that gets poured into developing a vaccine. Um, so when you don't have an immediate threat, like MERS was an immediate threat in like 2018. So the funding for them fell through as far as continuing on with this phase one clinical trial. Okay. And then here comes, you know, COVID, here comes SARS-CoV-2. So they already had the technology developed. They had already gone through so many testings to look at the way they were developing their mRNA vaccine that it already is going to work. So what they all, all they had to do was swap spike proteins. Mm, okay. And that's what they did. So they got rid of the spike protein for MERS and put the spike protein in for SARS-CoV-2. And within three weeks time, they were already in a phase one clinical trial because they had already done some animal trials with the MERS one. So then because of the special need, they were able to now just jump into a phase one. Um, so I think what they did was that they did skip over, generally speaking, you do preclinical trials, which is looking at animals. So they did kind of skip over the uh, monkey sector portion because you do mice and you do monkeys and they started with the phase one clinical trial and then eventually went back and did monkeys as well um and so that's how they were you starting with humans correct yes the phase one is starting with a small number of uh, pa uh human patients um and you're just looking at to see whether or not you're going to develop any sort of immune response okay. um, at all in this small cohort of people. And then when you're able to see this immune response, then you can move to a phase two, where now you're using a large number of people and now you're gonna work at what dosage you're gonna give. Mm, so nice. some people get a small dose, some people get a large dose, some people don't get a dose at all. And then in phase three, you're probably already going to, by that time, you're going to know what dosage you're going to give. You're probably going to try a booster shot, or maybe you did the booster shot in the phase two. But in phase three, you use a larger number of people because the bigger the number of people you use, the more likely you are to find that kind of rare person that's going to have maybe a negative reaction, or, you know, now you're testing in more people, so you're going to see what the real story is going to be. But usually by the time like phase three rolls around, you probably pretty much know that this vaccine or what you're studying or 
testing on is actually going to work for you. That's really But great. they did, but there, there were, usually we're talking about like 10 to 15 years that yeah. they do studies like this. Um, <laughs> and the bulk of it is the research portion, right? So the bulk of that is like the first five to 10 years is researching before you even get into an animal if this is actually going to work. Wow. So really the last part of phase one, phase two, phase three is the shorter of the entire like, okay. you know, 20 years span. So we just kind of ramped it up because we were fortunate enough to already have known that these mRNA vaccines had been studied on and were working for others. That's awesome. And for explaining that and, and where we are in the process. And so it wasn't like an overnight or over year thing. Um, this had been, you know, building um, over over time. Um, I think one of the things you, you begin to talk about the, the vaccines that are on the market right now. Um, so Moderna, and Pfizer, can you talk about the effectiveness and the effectiveness in comparison to other vaccines that are pretty standard, um, you know, when you when you're birthed, you know, so can you talk about the effectiveness of that? So I think um, we have a lot of, so you have to think about it, there are probably around like 1300 human viruses okay. <laughs> or human pathogens that can like infect us. And we have maybe 13 or 14 vaccines. Wow. So that should just give you an idea of how difficult it is to create a vaccine. And so we have some of these vaccines that from our childhood that we get, generally most of the vaccines are probably going to be some sort of protein that's just injected into your arm. Um, or like with the flu vaccine. Yeah, the flu vaccine is generally like a protein. It's injected into your arm. You get this, you know, foreign protein in your arm, in your system, and then your body reacts to it and creates antibodies against it. And these, or sometimes they're actually portions of viruses that have been heat inactivated or chemically inactivated okay. in some way. So you get like an actual virus but it doesn't replicate in your system. Okay. Or sometimes you get an inactivated virus, which can be a virus that will replicate in your system, but it actually won't cause disease, but it will just lead to an immune response. Okay. So um, a virus like that would be a polio vaccination. Mm. I mean, um, for us, polio, I think uh, we've eradicated polio a long time ago. And I think starting in maybe 2000, they stopped giving the oral polio vaccine to us in the U.S. You just get the inactivated one in your arm. But the oral okay. polio vaccine is still being used um, in other countries. Oh. But it's a, you know, it's a very robust uh, vaccine that causes a robust immune response. So those are pretty much tried and true vaccines, just like killed virus, inactivated virus, um, proteins that will lead to an immune response. So... But this new technology, we're just actually delivering uh, mRNA, what the M stands for messenger. So you're delivering messenger RNA directly into your system. And what that does is that it uses your cells own machinery to actually produce the protein in within your cells. So now your cells are actually producing the protein that now is going to go out into your body and now your body is going to produce an immune response to that. So it's pretty new. And um, one of the caveats or problems with it is that it needs to be packaged pretty, um, the, the packaging, you have these kind of like lipids or like this kind of like an oily layer that gets mixed in with it to kind of protect the mRNA so that it can be delivered into your cells and everything has to be kept really, really cold in mm -hmm. order for it to be transferred. Okay. Um, so that makes sense. That why, causes why issues we... with storage. Yep. That makes sense. Whereas I think other, I think most vaccines, if it's a protein, proteins are pretty stable. Um, so they don't need a super cold storage, but um, messenger RNA in general is a pretty unstable um, gene product. So it really needs to be kept protected so that it can act, you know, not degrade on transport so that it can be effective to go into your arm and lead to that wonderful immune response that we need <laughs> to get out of this mess. So let's just talk about mRNA for a minute, right? Because we've heard on the street, I've heard, 
you know, my friends aren't, uh, well, some of them are scientists, but not all of them. Uh, so I've heard that it changes your, your DNA. It changes your mm -hmm. RNA. Um, and um, it will alter, <laughs> like, your genome. <laughs> like, so your genes. So I, can we talk about, you, you touched on it, but can we, can we dispel that myth that mRNA, a M stands for messenger, um, that it does not change your, uh, your, your DNA or RNA? So uh, let's talk about what it is. So um, basically what messenger RNA is, is that what RNA is, is actually just a copy of your DNA. So our DNA is what uh, codes for everything that we kind of see on the surface of us, our hair, our skin color, our eye color, you know, mm, <laughs> our, our cheekbones, you know, it goes for pretty much everything that we see. So we want to, you know, keep all that DNA very well protected. So Basically, the DNA is in the nucleus of the cell. So you have like your cell and then right in the middle, kind of like your brain power is your nucleus and your nucleus surrounds your genetic material and protects it. So we don't want that genetic material to leave the nucleus. So instead, what we do is that you just make basically a carbon copy of what you need from that DNA at that time. So that carbon copy is RNA. So RNA is just kind of like a chemical cousin to DNA. Um, whereas DNA is very stable because we need it to be stable in our cells So because it holds all of our genetic information. RNA is unstable. So that means it can be degraded pretty quickly in the cell because you don't want lots of copies of your genetic material floating around your <laughs> cell. So once it's used, it gets degraded pretty quickly. So the RNA comes out of the nucleus and basically it gets kind of like a cap and a tail. So a little bit of protection around it. And that's when it's called messenger RNA. Okay. And so it's recognized by the cell by that cap and tail. And then from there it goes on and that RNA gets red and then it gets red and turned into proteins. And then those proteins go out and then become our hair and all of our beautiful features. So essentially what we're just doing you know, what this vaccine is doing is just taking advantage of the fact that our cells recognize this messenger RNA and create proteins from it. So all the, vi the vaccine is, is just messenger RNA of the COVID spike protein. Okay. So that's all it is. And so it gets delivered into us. Our cell goes, hey, look, here's some messenger RNA. And then it just turns that into protein. And what's great is that... Um, Normally, what would happen is that if you have foreign protein in your body, so our bodies are very smart, like we probably are the most sophisticated machinery on earth, I would dare say. Mm. So our bodies know our um, genetic material, they know our proteins versus foreign protein. Mm. So we can make our bodies can make our messenger RNA into protein and say, okay, that's hair. And then okay, now there's this spike protein being made. We don't know what that is. And so now you're going to get an immune response to fight that off. That's where Got your it. immune system will kick in. Got it. That makes so much sense. So the message is like, hey, we need some protein. So we're still getting this base of this protein that we use in like the polio. Um, and I believe the flu uses a, the protein, uh, the flu yeah. vaccination uses a protein as well. Um, but what they're saying is now we're just going to send the envelope and you, your body's going to create these proteins itself. Is that correct? Yes. I'm a scientist. Why are you <laughs> You're done. <laughs> Let's get into the garage and make some sequence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So can we talk a little bit about where we are? Because I've seen parties, boat parties, clubs, bars full, ain't no masking. So I see concerts, you know, uh, artists have been having like full-fledged concerts. There's All-Star Weekend going on in uh, Atlanta this weekend. And uh, yeah, so masks are not as prevalent as we thought they would be. A lot of things people are saying is, hey, you know, I've heard a lot of, it's a lot of theories out there. One, we talk about uh, herd, herd immunity, right? So that's one thing I want you to talk about. But another thing on the back end of that is people who have had COVID, which is a significant a lot of people, 
uh, more than the um, half a million who have passed, right? I don't even know what that number is offhand, sorry, yeah. um, who have contracted COVID um, are feeling that they are, you know, full throttle immune to, you know, uh, getting um, COVID again or spreading it to anyone else. Yes, and Dr. Gaskin, we already mentioned that in you and that Texas has lifted those requirements, and so did Mississippi. Um, so you'll get the replay where you uh, heard, your, heard your name. But thanks for joining <laughs> us. Um, so, yeah, um, can you talk about what is herd immunity? How does it actually work? And, you know, where are we in that process? So herd immunity just means that if you have um, protected against, if you yourself are protected against um a virus being infected into you, then therefore you can, you, you're not going to get a virus from somebody else. And so then if, but if everybody around you, if you're the only person that's protected against the virus, everybody else around you isn't, then they can spread the virus to each other and then out mm -hmm. to somebody else and then out to somebody else. But the more people that are protected, say that they get a vaccine, you could have like 10 people in a circle protect with the vaccine and then one person in the middle of that circle that is, does not have the vaccine and those people are protecting them from actually getting infected from the virus. So, so herd immunity just- It's not hoping for them. It's not like no masks. <laughs> it's completely opposite of the definitions that I think are going around. Yeah, it's basically, you know, once you get vaccinated, the more people that get vaccinated, the more people that are protected from getting infected. So it's not, oh, if I'm infected, now I'm protected. And the more people that get infected can now have protection from this virus. That is not the definition of herd immunity. Herd immunity is you get vaccinated, he gets vaccinated, she gets vaccinated, they get vaccinated, and those vaccinated people start to keep kind of create like a wall almost mm -hmm. around unvaccinated people so that they don't become infected with the virus. And generally speaking, people that are not going to get um, vaccinated are some people that have really compromised immune systems. Mm, so there are some people that can't afford to get vaccinated um, with certain vaccines like for polio for example because it's a live you know the oral polio vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine so someone with a compromised immune system that could actually be worse for them than um not getting the vaccine but the more people that are vaccinated around them can protect them from actually getting infected so herd immunity is not let's all get have like a a chicken pox party <laughs> and we're protected like they used to do with kids, right? No, it's let's all get vaccinated so that we can, you know, help those that can't get vaccinated. That makes so much more sense. And you, you do remember hearing people like, oh, let's get the chicken pox out early. So that way, you know, you're immune to it later on. I never had the chicken pox. So thank God. But, um, you know, I do remember everybody getting it like around the same time and, and kind of, but that makes so much more sense that, okay, we all need to create this wall. I think one of the early um, visuals uh, that were going around about, you know, the importance of wearing a mask and social distancing is um, the matches, right? They were like matches and there's some, some fire and how quickly, but if there's a person with a mask, it, it begins to create this barrier where, um, or social distancing where everybody's not getting hit or maybe it was dominoes or something. There was something like a ripple effect, uh, but anybody who was following the CDC guidelines that were able to create, stop the spread of it so quickly. Um, so that's really good to know. Can we talk a little bit about immunity? Uh, a lot of people have experienced COVID, unfortunately, to various degrees, right? Um, I know so many people who, um, you know, was was very sick and, you know, have recovered, thankfully. And then there's some, of course, that we have lost uh, in this year. Can you talk about the post-COVID immunity and how long that may last and what does that look like? I think we're still coming up learning about how long this immunity lasts. Um, if you had COVID. And I think there's been just a couple of kind of stories that came out where someone 
was reinfected with COVID, although they weren't able, I think from what I read, they weren't able to tell if the person actually had cleared the, va the virus from their system completely. Okay. Um, so, you know, so how long does immunity last? I think we're still learning that. I mean, there's so much information that comes out every day, right? Like, right. okay, the vaccine only lasts six months. Okay, it's a year. Okay, we have to get it every year. You know, um, okay, there's a variant. Like, we have now we have to panic. So there's still so much information that we don't understand about it. Um, and I wouldn't, you know, say that the issue is, okay, am I protected against COVID um, if I got it? My concern would be, if you got it, what would you, the long-term effects be? Because mm -hmm. they, what they know now is that there are a lot of people that are suffering the, the downstream effects of having, have had COVID. Right. And, you know, if they had a really bad uh, response to, if they were down for the count, you know, this is causing damage in your internal organs. This is, mm -hmm. you know, it's a vascular disease at some point in time. It gets, you know, into, it can damage your kidneys and damage your lungs and damage your right. liver. Um, it, they're, they're showing their, there's neurological effects that um, are long lasting after you clear the virus. Um, so whether or not you're protected, uh, they still don't know or how long you'll be protected. But what they do know is that it's pretty grave. Even if you were to overcome it, you might have some long, definitely long-term damage to your system. So, um, but I think what they're, you know, saying right now, as far as the vaccine is concerned, is that it's probably like six months to a year that they know of that, um, of protection. Um, and we don't really know anything because, you know, We've only, like, who are in the phase, we probably are still looking at the phase one clinical trial people to figure <laughs> that out. Um, so you would imagine that if you had the virus and you cleared it, it might be similar to that of the vaccine, right? Like you okay. might have protection six months to a year out. Um, and maybe actually because you had a natural infection, your immune response might be stronger. Generally speaking, natural infections produce a stronger immune response than vaccines do. Vaccines are always trying to mimic natural infections. So I think there, um, there's probably some data out there at that, this point looking into that. But um, I would definitely say that regardless, what they're saying is that even if you had COVID or you had the vaccine, you could still potentially just have a milder form of COVID, okay. um, even if you were to get infected, and you could still spread that to someone who has not been protected in any way. So um, there's still concern, and the debate is still out as to how long any of this protection is going to last. That's something, because I hadn't even heard that, and I thought I was saying a breast that I didn't understand it was going to be more like a yearly or bi-yearly thing, um, similar to the flu um, vaccinations um, that are, you know, typically short-term. And then also, I believe that the flu has, like, different strains every year as well, so they vaccinate based off the strain that is, is prevalent, prevalent for that year um, or the previous yeah. season, correct? Um, so that's something to keep in mind um, that probably still won't be like <laughs> going to raise and, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> turning up completely, um, even once we're back. Got to get in these streets. <laughs> in these streets. <laughs> um, so we still have to take those protections. And I think that's really good for, you know, for people who have had COVID already, already and to make sure that they're cautious for themselves and for their families and anyone else that they may come in contact with um, that you can still maybe carry it and still pass it along as well. Can you touch yeah. on variants for a second? So let's talk about that a little bit and how they uh, happen in viruses in general and in how they're showing up in this particular COVID-19 uh, virus. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yes, definitely. Uh, so let's talk about variants. You mentioned variants okay. um, earlier. So we want to talk about how do they normally behave in viruses and how are they behaving in this COVID-19 uh, virus? So the interesting thing about RNA viruses is that they um, mutate quite a bit. Um, so when we think about, when we go back to our own machinery, when we look at our DNA, 
you know, we make lots of copies of cells all the time um, in our bodies. And so our DNA, we have machinery in our nucleus that are copying our DNA all the time. Um, and so what happens is that sometimes you get errors when the machine is copying your DNA, you get errors into that DNA, that growing strand. But we also have, as a part of that machine, you have proofreading. So it can actually go back edit the mistake that it made and then continue on. This way we're not riddled with a lot of mutations in our own DNA so that, you know, our hair doesn't, you know, all of a sudden start changing on us, you know, <laughs> or our skin color or eye color or anything like that. Um, so with RNA viruses, they're a lot smaller than us. Um, they're pretty small. So they get rid of a lot of that machinery so they can actually package everything up in their tiny little, um, protein envelope coats and go about their business. So they don't, uh, RNA viruses do not have proofreading mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So as they copy themselves, errors get put into the growing gene genome and they stay. Um, so what's really amazing about the corona coronaviruses, they're actually kind of one of the largest RNA viruses. So they actually have proofreading mechanisms in them. So they can actually, they don't, they're not able to correct all the mistakes, but they are actually correct more mistakes. So they mutate a little slower compared to something like influenza. Um, so that's great news for us because, you know, with every year we have to get a new flu shot because influenza is a little bit more complicated and it, the way its genome is constructed compared to that of SARS-CoV-2. But with CoV-2, you know, you're still going to get some mutations, but at the end of the day, you're going to get a lot fewer. Okay. Now, um, what viruses, you know, they're just passing through us. You know, they don't have any kind of idea of what they're doing, but as they pass through us and they mutate, some mutations are beneficial to the virus and some aren't. There's quite, you know, as they mutate, pretty much more than like a large percentage of mutations that are acquired in these viruses actually kind of like kill the virus and make them inactivated. Mm -hmm. um, but every now and then one mutation will cause a virus to kind of function better. So what we're seeing with these types of variants that are coming out, there are mutations that are in the spike protein that are actually making the virus more transmittable. Okay. So it's easier to pass it for it to, I guess, attach to your cell receptors or your ACE2 receptor um, and then get into your system. Um, so with that being said, they don't seem to actually be more dangerous or cause more disease in us okay. they're just able to transmit better but if you think about it if they has a better transmissibility then it can infect more people and then you can see an uptick in infections and an uptick in deaths so right. just because it's not more dangerous it can get to a wider audience now and then in you know, the more people you infect, the higher, the more people that are going to succumb to the virus. Um, but and you say, you say that the virus doesn't know what it's doing, but I think this COVID <laughs> is like, well, you know, animals. it's about survival, <laughs> right? you know, so like the best viruses. So I, you know, uh, I always say like, you know, my favorite virus is Ebola because it was one of the first viruses I ever read about. And it, what got me interested in studying viruses, but it's not the smartest virus okay. because once it gets in you, I mean, we're not its natural host. So once it gets inside of us, it, you know, replicates really fast. It outpaces our immune response and it causes heavy damage in our bodies. And then we, we suffer, you know, depending on the strain of Ebola, it's 50 to 90% lethal. Wow. So it's a pretty wow. bad virus. And the, the more lethal it is, the actually less able it is to transmit to somebody else because you're so sick. Oh, people wow. are going to see you right. and they're going to say that person's sick. I'm going to stay over here. And then you're not going to get that virus. So the virus can't spread too far. Okay. But the less lethal a virus is, the further it can spread. So what's happening, what we see with COVID or with SARS-CoV-2 is that, yes, the transmissibility is higher, but it's not really causing that much disease. So people are walking around not knowing that they're infected. You don't look infected. I'm going to talk to you. And now it's spread to me. Right. So the, the better, 
the smarter viruses, yes, they are able to transmit to more people and go a lot further than, Quicker. you know, before. The, yeah. Before so the that, that's what we're seeing time. right now. Yeah. Yeah. So the, it'll be, and that's one of the things I think you, you taught me last year is like the virus can be, you know, 200 people down the line before you even start showing, you know, symptoms um, for yourself. If, if you have any symptoms, you know, it's, it's already too late. You've already infected, you know, uh, right, right. More, more people than you can count. Well, that is um, everything I had. That was a, a lot of great information, a lot of accurate <laughs> information, um, a lot of technical information, and I think it would be very digestible. I want to make sure there are no questions um, by chance. If you do have any, let us know, um, and so we can – get those answered and I'm just going to double check to make sure um okay did we talk a bit about the effective effectiveness rate on for Pfizer in Moderna like the rate of effectiveness and then what other vaccines I believe Johnson just got released um is it Johnson and Johnson um Johnson and Johnson yeah okay um can you talk a little bit about that yeah, so the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, they have like a 95% effective rate. So that means that, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, that's incredible to hear that you can get this vaccine and then you are essentially like two doses and you are protected from severe disease at least, right? So right. is what they're saying. So that's great. Um, and these both use the new mRNA vaccine technology. Um, the downside is that there are there have been reports of out allergic reactions to these uh, vaccines, probably due to maybe the chemical components okay. um, that are mixed in to that help to stabilize and help deliver the mRNA to your, your cells better. Um, so with, you know, some people, if you do have severe re allergic reactions, probably to, you know, like pollens or food or um, even to drugs, like such as like antibiotics or um, anything like that, you might want to talk to your healthcare professional or to any healthcare professional if you don't have one of your own and see what are your options, you know, what would be the best method. Um, should you, if you get the vaccine, do you, how long do you have to stay with the doctor to make sure that, you know, you're not having any adverse reactions or effects? Um, but also the other option is to get a different vaccine, okay. which is great because now Johnson and Johnson vaccine is coming out and that uses kind of tried and true technology, okay. which is an adenovirus vaccine vector. And so adenoviruses are just viruses that are actually out in the, out in the world. Um, they cause the common cold in us. Oh. So there's lots of different strains of adenoviruses and there's actually different strains of different animals. Um, so you can get an adeno. So they replicate really well in us. They cause mild disease in us. So what we know, we've known about adenoviruses for years and years. And so um, we can just make that vac virus more mild, you know, the cold symptoms mild, and then just stick that spike protein, code that spike protein into that adenovirus vector and then inject it into you. Um, and it's much more stable, so they don't have to ship it in, you know, negative 80 degree temperatures. Is it that um, so, <laughs> but the difference with the Johnson & Johnson is that it's only like 66 or 68% effective. And while that sounds bad compared to Pfizer or Moderna, one, you're not getting probably less likely to get those nasty, adverse allergic reaction side effects that you would potentially see with the mRNA vaccines. But also the more people that get the Johnson Johnson vaccine or any vaccine, the higher the efficacy rate of that vaccine goes up. So when we talked about herd immunity before, so it may be 66% effective, but if everybody gets it, now it's going to jump up to maybe like 80% effectiveness because right. now everybody has it. So even now, instead of you just protecting, you and your friends protecting this one person that can't get a vaccine, now you and your friends are actually protecting each other. Yeah. So, um, and then also AstraZeneca is close to having a vaccine come out too, which is using the same technology as Johnson and Johnson, which is okay. that adenovirus vaccine. So yeah, so then there should hopefully be another option coming out soon. 
Okay, that's great. Great to know. And it seems like they are becoming more and more readily available um, in, in the rollout, which is which is great news. We have a question uh, from Sharna. She would love to know your thoughts on the theories that believe one dose of the vaccine is effective. So, yeah, the, uh, I think the Johnson & Johnson is the one dose. And um, generally speaking, like what happens during these clinical trials, which is why they're, you know, so important to go through the phase one, phase two, phase three, is to see whether or not if you're going to give one dose, how protective it's going to be. If you give two doses, if you give a booster shot, mm -hmm. is that booster going to you know, raise up the level of protection that you see. Um, and so probably what they saw with Johnson & Johnson is that they did booster shots and they never saw any better protection than they did with just a single shot. Okay. So I do know at one point in time, reports were coming out that Johnson & Johnson was going to pull their vaccine from the market because it wasn't as effective compared to Moderna and Pfizer. But you know, when you look at the flu shot, the flu shot isn't really that effective either. It might be 10 to 50% effective, depending upon how well they know which virus is kind of coming around, circulating around. So, um, yeah, when, you, when we're talking about just one shot, it just means that they tested the booster shots, they didn't see any difference. And so that one shot is pretty much all you're going to need. Um, but with Pfizer and Moderna, as far as like two shots are going, they tested one shot, they got maybe 50% effectiveness, they waited, they boosted it, and boom, they saw it go straight up. There are vaccines that are out there already in which you do get boosters, like if you ever got a hep B or a hep A I vaccination, like I've had so hepatitis before. A or hepatitis okay. B, yeah, you have to get boosters for those. And there's a lot of childhood vaccines that you have to get booster shots for that too, because the first shot kind of lays down, establishes your um, immune response. And it says, like, it, it tells your immune response, okay, here's something. And then your immune system looks at it and recognizes it. But once you get that booster shot, then your immune system can create memory cells. Mm -hmm. And those memory cells for the rest of your life will always remember that it saw that protein or that vaccine before. Okay. So when you're getting a booster, you're actually just now taking all those memory cells that are starting to kind of be created and you're just increasing them even more. And so um, that's why you would need a booster. So as far as whether or not you should get a second dose, because it sounds like the second dose from Pfizer and Moderna is what's causing you to be sick, right. that um, even without the allergic reaction, that illness, that malaise, that fever that you're feeling, that's your immune system working. Mm -hmm. So whenever we feel sick, when we feel feverish, when we feel tired, that's our immune system fighting off what's ever inside of us. So uh, while it may not feel good, it's actually a very good, very good response. That's good to know. And good for people to kind of say, okay, for the first shot, I may be okay going back to work, going back to my plans, but maybe for the second shot then I need to plan around making sure I have time to rest maybe having someone you know um, drive there you know just kind of make sure that you're you're taking yeah. care of yourself especially if you have a high reaction and I know I do so I, I typically have uh, adverse reactions to to foreign um, yeah. uh, chemicals in my body yeah but um I am hopeful <laughs> I and we wanted to host this just to make sure people had the best information right we're not here to sell one thing or another to you we want you to make very informed decisions for you and your family and your community um and so i personally um am, am planning to get the vaccine as soon as um my my dad has been vaccinated he uh has some, some serious underlying conditions um, my mom is getting vaccinated very soon in texas especially now with this um mask lift i am I, I stress so much about them getting this yeah. virus, especially for older black men. That that fatality rate is is cutting through black men um, that are over sixty years old, and, and we're losing a lot of people. Um, so it's a very ruthless disease. And I think we have to keep that in mind when we're thinking about how does this affect the people that we love. How does it affect you know our future generations? Um, and being able yeah. to connect um, our, 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 
to get beyond this. Um, so I am, I'm an optimist, <laughs> optimistic person in general, but where do you feel we are, you know, I know last year you just shook your head. Uh, how do you feel about this year? Are we headed in the right direction? Um, or you're just like, it's going to be another 10 years since? You know, last year, <laughs> I was actually really excited um, that, you know, these vaccines were in clinical trials so quickly, like I just couldn't unfocus from that. But I knew, you know, hey, we're in this for a long time. But I can't tell you how excited I've been with this new administration that's come in. And they just, you know, ramped up production of those vaccines, just ramped them up. And we're hearing now that everybody, you know, all adults are going to get vaccinated by the end of May. What? You know, That's good. Tony Fauci said, you know, basically November. And I was like, well, my birthday is in November. Hey. So <laughs> I'll be in line <laughs> with my mask and my shot. But they're saying like everybody by the end of May. Um, I think that's really, it's just so hopeful because there is, there is a response. There is, mm. you know, we're talking about it. We're not grandstanding on TV, making crazy claims about things or bringing in people with crazy things to sell us. You know, right. that will protect us from this vaccine. No, we're getting a response from the government that says, we're not selling you anything. We're getting these ramped up. We're giving this to you. So yeah. it's so exciting to see there's movement, um, mm -hmm. movement being made in a positive direction. And I'm really excited to um, get my shot. My dad has already gotten his. Uh, he has uh, hypertension. So he, and he's 70. So he got his both of his shots. My mom is on the list to get hers. Um, you know, and my grandmother got hers. And she's in her 90s. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're really excited. And, uh, and that's that we even, can that's all get even just having that story, right? So just say, you know, we're three generations, maybe four generations in, and we don't want to just lose people just to this virus. Right. You know, so we want to continue yeah. to be able to celebrate um, these this, these legacies and these generations and, and honor them beyond this year, you know. Um, okay, Charlie said her dad received her second shot today. Mom has received her initial shot. I'm honestly still torn on my decision. And I think that's a, a really fair thing, right? I, I think we've yeah. all been there. Um, and I think just having more information, I think, begins to help guide navigate the fear the anxiety the hesitation right um and i think that's for me too because i i like just knowing that this people were having adverse uh, reactions i know when i was getting the tb uh test like my arm yeah like beyond the, the normal response <laughs> like i didn't have tb but my body was just like what is happening you know what i'm saying um and so just yeah. to have to be cautious um you know for myself but then also okay what are the precautions versus the risk of actually getting? I'm also a chronic. I have chronic asthma. I live alone. So those things are really important. To yeah. Sure about my personal health. Um, so I think those are decisions people have to make um, in every one situation is different. And we respect your ability to make decisions. We just want to make sure they're based off right. science and data and facts. Right. We're coming from a place of love because we definitely are not here to sell you anything <laughs> or, you know, um, Dr. Sherry is not, you know, giving, you know, side hustle of vaccines out of her pocket. So, no, <laughs> not at all. Um, if she did, I would be there, though. <laughs> like, smile me, yo. Smile me, smile me that vaccine. <laughs> um, but we greatly appreciate your time. Did you have any closing thoughts? Um, and Byron, Dr. Gaskin, is saying he's getting his as well. Um, so do you have any closing thoughts or anything that we missed that we need to make sure we get um, on here? So I, you know, I, I thought a lot about, um, you know, what are, what are the risks of getting the vaccine? Um, because I think we talk a lot about the risks of getting COVID, but we don't talk about the risks of getting the vaccine. And we've talked about, yeah, there's adverse effects. Um, you can have an allergic reaction um, and those types of things. But I, the way I see it is that the risk is that it doesn't work. 
So the risk is that it doesn't create, you know, immunity in you, right? So you're not immune to COVID. And I think that's probably in my mind, the greatest risk that if you're unsure, then maybe, you know, that's the risk that you should think about is that you just don't get any type of protection whatsoever. Um, and that being said, they've already shown that it's highly protective. So that should eliminate that, you know, potential risk. So really the risk of not getting it is getting COVID. And um, so that's something that you should really think about. I think what's really terrible in this country is that we still haven't um, acknowledged our past and the past, you know, grievances against black people and yes. against lots of minorities in this country. We just don't acknowledge it. And that's where the mistrust comes from, really, in my mind, in my opinion, is that when you consistently ignore the past or say that's the past, that's not the present, then the people in charge or the people that are everyday people, they don't notice things, they keep a blind eye to stuff. And that's how, you know, testing on black people can slip through the cracks. Right. And that's how people don't pay attention to those things. And until you say, oh, my God, this is what we did. We acknowledge it. We are wrong. We are going to pay some reparations. Then reparations! you can start getting, <laughs> you start getting trust from the people. And then you get nobody questioning your vaccine that you're making and get putting into everybody's arm. That's how I see it. So. That's a word. That's a word. Yeah. That's a word. That is a word, Dr. Sis. That is a word. <laughs> um, I a hundred percent concur. Um, you know, I'm I'm I actually have this wall behind me where I'm I'm reading uh I'm oh. reading an audible, but one of the things it talks about is how structural um the racial wealth gap is, but it talks too about um the economic psychological um and well-being well like our health has been uh violated again and and one of the things they're talking about there is restitution hasn't even happened there has not been a federal yeah. you know acknowledgement we're sorry yeah. uh that level needs to happen then reparations yeah. you know simultaneously can be you know begin to happen um and so there's there's so much work that this country um needs to do to begin to repair um, the damages that they have continued to benefit from on behalf of black bodies um, and black people. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah. All right. I think that is it. We are hoping that you all and your families are doing well. We continue to send you love and light. Uh, we ask that you continue to be safe. You know what I'm saying? Uh, continue to mm -hmm. wear your mask. Continue to wash your hands. Continue to not do, you know, <laughs> 100 people house parties and all of that. We would greatly appreciate uh, that. And uh, we'll see you soon. The next uh, Shape Up is March 18th. Uh, we're talking about Black men and vulnerability. Uh, Jay Hall and uh, Tariq, um, the Black uh, couples therapist, will be having that conversation. So uh, join right back here and we um wash your hands with so thank you so much dr gaskin for that you know we appreciate thank you yeah all the studies that you did to the country that <laughs> no, was a great reminder we, we appreciate you we love y'all we can't wait to see y'all in person one day maybe once we get vaccinated and the sun's out and we can you know at the club at the club i don't know i don't know if i'm going back to the club you have to meet me outside <laughs> All right. We love y'all. Y'all have a good evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Bye. Lee. Bye. Bye. Bye.